Philippines to hold joint naval drills with U.S., Japan, Australia. The Philippines will hold joint naval drills with the United States, Japan and Australia, two diplomatic sources told AFP Thursday, as the four countries deepen military ties to counter China's expanding influence in the Asia-Pacific region. The exercise will be held Sunday in the disputed South China Sea, which Beijing claims almost entirely, days before U.S. President Joe Biden is due to hold the first trilateral summit with the leaders of the Philippines and Japan. The diplomatic sources spoke on condition of anonymity because the drills have not yet been officially announced. Earlier this week, the Australian warship HMAS Waramunga arrived at the Philippine island province of Palawan, which faces the hotly contested waters. The Philippine military said the visit was aimed at strengthening military relations with partner nations. Regional tensions have escalated in the past year as China has become increasingly confident in asserting its claims over waters also claimed by the Philippines and Japan, as well as over self-ruled Taiwan. In response, the United States has sought to strengthen its alliances in the region, including with treaty allies Japan and the Philippines. Biden's planned April 11 summit with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida at the White House will be the latest in a series of meetings with Asia-Pacific partners. Biden will also hold separate bilateral meetings with Marcos and Kishida. Joint patrols between the U.S., Japanese and Philippine Coast Guards are expected to be announced during the summit, one of the diplomatic sources told AFP, after joint drills were held for the first time last year. The exercise and summit follow repeated confrontations between Chinese and Philippine vessels near disputed reefs off the Southeast Asian country in recent months. Top U.S. officials have repeatedly declared the United States' ironclad commitment to defending the Philippines against an armed attack in the South China Sea. Relations between Manila and Beijing have deteriorated under Marcos, who has taken a stronger stance than his predecessor Rodrigo Duterte against Chinese actions in the sea. China claims most of the waterway, through which trillions of dollars of trade passes annually, despite rival claims from other nations and an international ruling that its claim has no legal basis. Marcos issued a strongly worded statement on March 28, vowing the Philippines would not be cowed into silence, submission, or subservience by China. He also said the Philippines would respond to recent incidents with countermeasures that would be proportionate, deliberate, and reasonable. Meanwhile, talks between the Philippines and Japan for a defense pact that would allow the countries to deploy troops on each other's territory were still ongoing, a spokesman for the Philippine Foreign Affairs Department told reporters Thursday. Manila already has a similar agreement with Australia and the United States. In an interview with the Nikkei Business Daily on Thursday, Kishida said that Japan needs to show a bigger presence and take greater responsibility for providing options for the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries. He also said Tokyo, Washington and Manila will work together to proceed with trilateral cooperative projects, including in semiconductors, digital technology and next-generation nuclear energy. Taiwan condemns shameless China's thanks for global sympathy on quake. Taiwan on Thursday condemned China as shameless after Beijing's deputy ambassador to the United Nations thanked the world for its concern about a strong earthquake on the island. China claims democratically governed Taiwan as its own territory and also claims the right to speak for it on the international stage, to the fury of Taipei given Beijing's communist government has never ruled the island and has no say in how it chooses its leaders. On Wednesday, after the 7.2 earthquake hit eastern Taiwan, killing 10 people, China's deputy permanent representative to the UN, Deng Shuang, mentioned at a meeting about children's rights that another speaker had brought up the quake in China's Taiwan. China is concerned about the damage and has expressed condolences to Taiwan and offered aid, he said, according to a transcript of his remarks carried on the Chinese mission to the UN's website. We thank the international community for its expressions of sympathy and concern, he added. Taiwan's foreign ministry expressed anger at the remarks. The ministry solemnly condemns China's shameless use of the Taiwan earthquake to conduct cognitive operations internationally, it said, using Taiwan's normal term for what it views as Chinese psychological warfare. This shows China has no goodwill towards Taiwan, the ministry added. Taiwan's government has already thanked governments and leaders around the world for their messages of concern and offers of support including from the United States, the island's most important international supporter despite the lack of diplomatic ties. The defeated Republic of China government fled to Taiwan in 1949 after losing a civil war to Mao Zedong's communists, who established the People's Republic of China with its capital in Beijing.
Taiwan's formal name remains the Republic of China. Russia's Lavrov says Chinese peace plan on Ukraine is most reasonable so far. China has proposed the most reasonable peace plan so far for resolving the Ukraine conflict, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was quoted as saying on Thursday. Beijing put forward a 12-point paper more than a year ago that set out general principles for ending the war but did not get into specifics. It received a lukewarm reception at the time in both Russia and Ukraine, while the United States said China was presenting itself as a peacemaker but reflecting Russia's false narrative and failing to condemn its invasion. The most important thing for us is that the Chinese document is based on an analysis of the reasons for what is happening and the need to eliminate these root causes. It is structured in logic from the general to the specific, state news agency RIA quoted Lavrov as telling reporters. This plan was criticized for being vague. But this is a reasonable plan that the great Chinese civilization proposed for discussion. Lavrov is due to meet his Chinese counterpart soon and President Vladimir Putin said last month he would consider going to China for the first overseas trip of his new six-year term. Russia says it is willing to enter talks about Ukraine but that these must reflect what it calls the new realities on the ground, where its forces control just under a fifth of the country and Moscow has claimed for Ukrainian regions as its own. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has put forward his own peace formula that calls for a cessation of hostilities and a full Russian withdrawal from all occupied territory. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has put forward his own peace formula that calls for a cessation of hostilities and a full Russian withdrawal from all occupied territory. Praising China's plan provides Moscow with a way to signal that it is open to talking peace while attacking Zelensky's initiative, which Lavrov called, a menu from which you can pull out whatever you want. Switzerland has said it will host a conference based on Zelensky's plan, but Russia has called the initiative pointless and said it is doomed to fail without Moscow's participation. Russia says new South Korean sanctions are unfriendly, will respond. Russia considers South Korea's decision to impose sanctions against Russian individuals and entities as an unfriendly move and will respond in due course, Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said on Wednesday. South Korea has imposed sanctions against two Russian vessels which it says were carrying military cargo to North Korea. Seoul said on Tuesday it had also sanctioned two Russian organizations and two Russian citizens linked to Pyongyang's nuclear and missile programs. This is an unfriendly move by Seoul and is deeply regrettable. The imposition of, I emphasize, illegitimate sanctions will have a negative impact on relations with Russia. Zakharova told reporters at her weekly briefing. Russia is developing good neighborly ties with friendly North Korea in accordance with the norms of international law, without harming the national security of South Korea, she added. Ties between Moscow and Pyongyang have strengthened following North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's visit to Russia's Far East last year. Last week Russia vetoed the annual renewal of a panel of experts monitoring enforcement of United Nations sanctions against North Korea over its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. The U.S. has accused North Korea of transferring weapons to Russia for use in its war in Ukraine. Both Moscow and Pyongyang have denied the accusations. But vowed last year to deepen military relations. Seoul did not have a problem with ties between North Korea and Russia, South Korea's foreign ministry spokesman Lim Soo-suk said. As the Russian side itself states, Russia-North Korea cooperation must be conducted in compliance of Security Council resolutions and international laws and in a way that does not adversely affect our security, he told a briefing. South Korea continues to work on its ties with Moscow, Lim said, adding, we urge Russia to make sensible efforts as well. As a permanent member of the Security Council, Russia had voted to adopt multiple sanctions resolutions against the North until 2017 including bans on weapons trade, caps on supply of fuel and expulsion of North Korean workers. Zakharova on Wednesday reiterated that Moscow remained committed to UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea, in their entirety, but added that sanctions on Pyongyang were not working as intended. It is clearly seen that endless sanctions are completely useless for achieving the designated goals. They lead to a financial and economic blockade of an entire state with all the ensuing consequences for the population. She said. Zakharova accused the United States of seeking to foment instability on the Korean peninsula. South Korea apparently lacks the immunity to protect itself from Washington's external influence, she added. Germany's defense minister overhauls the military command as he seeks war-capable armed forces. 
Germany's defense minister on Thursday announced a plan to streamline and reorganize the country's military command as part of efforts to make the armed forces of NATO's most populous European member war capable. Chancellor Olaf Scholz set in motion a big increase in military spending shortly after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in early 2022, which he described as a turning point. Defense Minister Boris Pistorius last year took on the job of overhauling the military, the Bundeswehr, after years of neglect and in November called for a review of its structure. Pistorius has pointed to the danger of a possible future Russian attack on a NATO country and said repeatedly that the German military must become war capable. A choice of words that some in Germany find jarring given the country's long-standing post-World War II culture of military caution. I am convinced it is one of the few words that really describes correctly the imperative here, he told reporters in Berlin. I respect the fact that others struggle with the word, but I also note that most who do have no problem with the substance behind it. His overhaul plan envisions a single operational military command, which he hopes will enable quick decisions and eliminate duplication. Currently, the Bundeswehr has two command centers, one responsible for planning and running deployments abroad and the other for the defense of Germany itself. An existing cyber and information department, whose responsibilities include fending off cyber attacks, protecting electronic infrastructure and analyzing hybrid threats such as disinformation, will be expanded and officially become a fourth arm of the military alongside the Army, Air Force and Navy. Speaking on NATO's 75th anniversary, Pistorius underlined the challenge of resetting the Bundeswehr for a new and old challenge, that of defending the country and the alliance. In 2022, Scholz pledged to increase Germany's defense spending to a NATO target of 2% of gross domestic product, a mark that, along with several other countries, it had long fallen short of, and set up a 100 billion euro, 108 billion dollar euro, special fund to modernize the Bundeswehr. We have, spending of, 2% this year and we will reach it in the coming years as well, but also must reach it so that we can do justice to our responsibility in our role in NATO, Pistorius said. Details of how Germany will reach the 2% mark once the special military fund is exhausted, likely in 2027, remain unclear. And although progress is being made with orders for new equipment, the parliamentary commissioner for the military said last month that the Bundeswehr still has too little of everything. Venezuela's Maduro passes law to annex part of neighboring Guyana. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has passed a law to create a new Venezuelan state around the oil-rich region of Essequibo in neighboring Guyana. The decision taken by the Venezuelan people in the consultative referendum will be fulfilled in all its parts, and with this law we will defend Venezuela on the international stage, Maduro said on Wednesday. At the beginning of December, Maduro held a controversial referendum in Venezuela in which, according to official figures, 96% of participants voted in favor of the annexation of Guayana Esequiba as a Venezuelan federal state. The law will now establish the 24th federal state within Venezuela's territorial policy. According to the presidential palace, the population of this area will also have a representative in Venezuela's next parliament, which is scheduled to be elected in 2025. It also provides for the provision and formation of a high commission of the state and the country for the defense of Guayana Esequiba. This again raises fears that Venezuela could invade the region and trigger a war. Venezuela has long laid claim to the resource-rich territory, which covers around two-thirds of the neighboring country. The current borders were established in 1899 in an arbitration ruling by a tribunal in Paris, which was initiated by the United States and Britain. Venezuela refers to an agreement with the United Kingdom from 1966. A few months before the then colony of British Guiana became independent. This provided for a negotiated solution to the dispute. The International Court of Justice, ICJ, is dealing with the case at Guyana's request, but Venezuela rejects its jurisdiction, and has also enshrined this in the law that has now been passed. Venezuela says U.S. building secret bases in disputed Essequibo. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro on Wednesday accused the United States of building secret military bases in Essequibo, an oil-rich region of Guyana that Caracas claims as its territory. We have information proving that in the territory of Guyana Essequibo, temporarily administered by Guyana, secret military bases of the U.S. Southern Command, a body of the CIA, have been installed, Maduro said. He said the bases are an aggression against the people of southern and eastern Venezuela and were built to prepare for an escalation against Venezuela.
Maduro's provocative remarks came as Parliament held a ceremony commemorating a recent law laying out the defense of Guyana Essequibo. For months after a controversial, non-binding referendum overwhelmingly approved the creation of a Venezuelan province in the disputed region, sparking fears of a military conflict. He also claimed that his counterpart, President Irfan Ali, does not govern Guyana, and that, Guyana is governed by the Southern Command, the CIA, and ExxonMobil. Southern Command, part of the Department of Defense, maintains a U.S. security cooperation office in Guyana. The office serves as a military consultant to the Guyana Defense Force, coordinating security cooperation engagement activities and providing military support and training. The dispute over Essequibo, which makes up about two-thirds of Guyana's territory and has been administered by Guyana for more than a century intensified in 2015 after the discovery of oil deposits by U.S.-based energy giant ExxonMobil. Tensions soared after December's referendum. Days later, U.S. forces held joint U.S.-Guyana military exercises. Both countries pledged last year not to use force to settle the border dispute, which is currently before the International Court of Justice in The Hague. U.S. ally Jordan rocked by pro-Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood protests over Gaza war. One of the U.S.'s closest Mideast allies, Jordan, has been hit by demonstrations that, according to some analysts, have spilled over into a serious threat to the Hashemite kingdom with open declarations of support for the Hamas terrorist organization. Jordan's government has been one of the most vocal opponents of Israel's war to root out Hamas terrorists from Gaza after the jihadi movement slaughtered 1,200 people on October 7, including many Americans. Jordan's deputy prime minister and foreign minister Ayman Safadi declared in November that Hamas is an idea and ideas do not die. Jordan's queen Rania cast doubt in a CNN interview on whether Hamas really committed atrocities on October. 7. Veteran experts on Jordan view King Abdullah II and his inner circle as contributing, directly and indirectly, to the unrest that could potentially dislodge his regime. The former Israeli ambassador to Jordan, Jacob Rosen, told Fox News Digital that Jordan is walking on a very tight rope. The authorities let the Muslim Brotherhood under whatever cover they operate to voice out their message, but they disperse any demonstrations that may go wrong or to turn against the government itself. Rosen, who speaks fluent Arabic and is a leading expert on the Hashemite Kingdom, added that Jordan operates for some years a military hospital in Gaza, which has no choice but to be in contact with whoever is in control there. There is also a sizable contingent of Gazans in Jordan, at least 300,000, which has to be considered. Parallel to that, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ayman Safadi, has a free hand with anti-Israeli rhetoric accusing Israel of genocide and warning against ethnic cleansing. But in any case, Jordan cannot condemn Hamas directly but let some publicists or ex-ministers to do that. Last week, protesters chanted, We are your men, Sinwar. Yehya Sinwar is the Hamas mastermind behind the October 7 attack and is believed to be hiding in Gaza's vast underground tunnel system. Walid Fares, an expert in foreign policy, told Fox News Digital, What is happening in Jordan now, while it appears as chaotic, is in fact tightly organized by Hamas, the larger Muslim Brotherhood network and the Iran regime. The protests against the Israeli embassy and spillover in Amman streets are the result of tightly coordinated moves by the Iran and Ikhwan networks, with the real target being the Hashemite kingdom itself. The term Ikhwan is an Arabic word that refers to the Muslim Brotherhood. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt have classified the Muslim Brotherhood as a foreign terrorist organization. Indeed, just this week, the former Jordanian Minister of Information, Sami al Maya, said on the Saudi Arabian TV network Al Arabiya, the Hamas leaders in Qatar have incited the Jordanian public, and they are inciting the tribes, inciting people to take to the streets and to chant new, anti Jordanian, slogans. They are trying to say to Jordan, we own the Jordanian public. The US based Middle East Media Research Institute first located and translated Al Maya's comments. It was also reported in Israeli media that Al Maya told another Saudi channel, Al Hadith, that Hamas leader Khaled Meshel was sowing discord among Palestinian clans in the kingdom. Al Maya suggested that Meshel be stripped of his Jordanian citizenship as well as those stoking conflict. Fares, the author of Iran, an imperialist republic and U.S. policy, said, Some in Israel and the U.S. assert that the Queen and Foreign Minister contributed in encouraging demonstrations against Israel. 
But an examination of the domestic situation in Jordan shows that the royal government had to show that they are in solidarity with the Palestinian people as a way to avert an intifada waged by Hamas, precisely. Jordanians argue that had the US administration not been so attached to the Iran deal, Hamas wouldn't have been encouraged to attack Israel, and Arab allies would have acted differently and earlier. He continued, hence, we know that Tehran and Damascus have been targeting the Hashemite kingdom for years, and now it looks like they've unleashed their supporters against the regime. The fragility of Jordan's kingdom has made it a target for past efforts to oust the king. The nation does not have an oil and gas industry. The unemployment rate is more than 20% and the kingdom has made no real effort to heighten awareness about the need for peace with Israel's population following the 1994 peace accord between the Jewish state and Amman. Fares said that, almost half of the Jordanian population is of Palestinian descent, and an attempt by Yasser Arafat and the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, backed by the Assad regime, in Syria, to take over the country was averted by the loyal Jordanian armed forces. The more Israel closed in on Hamas the more the Islamists of Jordan closed in on the Jordanian government, he continued. Obviously, the best gate for Iran and the Brotherhood, Red, Hamas, to ignite an intifada in the kingdom is a series of violent protests against the Israeli embassy to appear in sync with the protests everywhere else. But the second stage is in the form of clashes with Jordanian security forces. This old Bolshevik and later jihadi tactic aims at putting large segments of society against their own armed forces, which I believe is the ultimate goal of the Iran axis. It is about taking out Jordan as a Western ally and spread chaos, leading to sending militias across the borders. President Biden met with Abdullah in February at the White House, where the leaders discussed the war in Gaza. King Abdullah said, we cannot afford an Israeli attack on Rafah, adding that, it is certain to produce another humanitarian catastrophe. The last vestiges of Hamas battalions are in the city of Rafah in the Gaza Strip. Hamas is also holding more than 100 hostages who are believed to be in Rafah. Biden thanked Jordan at the meeting for its humanitarian aid to Gaza, stating, we're grateful to our partners and allies like the king who work with us every single day to advance security and stability across the region and beyond. It's difficult times like these when the bonds between nations are more important than ever. Biden said at the meeting with the king that a Palestinian state could lead to stability and peace with Israel's Arab neighbors. That effort was underway before the October 7 attacks, Biden said, adding, it's even more urgent today. The mood in Israel, however, largely contradicts Biden's optimism, as most Israelis see the two-state solution as a kind of dead man walking idea after more than 70 years of failed attempts. An unnamed Jordanian official condemned the protests by saying, Hamas is inciting and trying to ignite unrest inside the kingdom. We will not allow it to achieve its goal. The growing Iranian threat to Jordan's government further surfaced when a security official from the pro-Iran regime militia said about intervention in the Hashemite kingdom, the Islamic resistance in Iraq is ready to meet the needs of 12. 000 fighters, so that we can stand united in defending our brothers in Palestine. The security situation for Jordan appears to be raising alarm bells within the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, known as Judea and Samaria in Israel. The president of the PA, Mahmoud Abbas, spoke with King Abdullah II on Tuesday and reiterated during the call Palestine stand in solidarity with the Kingdom of Jordan. Headed by King Abdullah II, according to the Palestinian Wafa News Agency. Wafa also wrote, President Abbas stressed the complete rejection of all attempts to tamper with Jordan's security and stability or attempts to exploit the suffering of the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip to tamper with the Jordanian arena, affirming the rejection of any external interference in the internal Jordanian affairs. The external interference is an apparent reference to the pro-Iranian regime proxies in Iraq. A Jordanian government spokesperson had no comment when asked by Fox News Digital about the recent unrest in Amman, anti-Israel rhetoric from the government, and whether Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood should be designated as terrorist organizations. U.S. troops warned to brace for retaliation from Iran after strike kills top commanders. U.S. troops serving in the Middle East may be under a renewed threat of attacks by Iran and its proxies following an airstrike on Iran's consulate in Syria on Monday. Lt. Gen. Alexis Grinkwich, a top commander with the U.S. Air Force, said the strike, believed to be carried out by Israel, may be a catalyst for renewed attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria. The U.S. suffered over 150 such attacks in the months following October 7, but those attacks slowed after three American troops were killed in January.
I am concerned because of the Iranian rhetoric talking about the US, that there could be a risk to our forces. Grinkwich said. The US has insisted to Iran that it had nothing to do with Monday's strike in Syria. Nevertheless, Iranian officials have said they hold the US just as responsible for the attack as Israel. Israel has not confirmed its own involvement in the attack, though US officials have said evidence indicates it was an Israeli strike. Iranian officials have vowed swift retaliation for the attack, but experts say response is likely to be carried out through Iran's network of terrorist proxies, such as Hamas, the Houthis and Hezbollah. Hezbollah has also vowed punishment and revenge for the attack, calling those killed in the strike martyrs. Yigal Karman, a former advisor to two Israeli prime ministers on countering terrorism and founder and president of the Middle East Media Research Institute, Memory, told Fox News Digital that, Iran's supreme leaders, policies over the years reflect cowardice. The Iranian pattern of reaction is such that he escalates when he feels that the other side is afraid of him, and backs down when the other side shows deterrence. He continued, in the attack on an official Iranian government target in Damascus, Israel escalated against Iran, telling Iran that Israel will not continue with the proxy game so commonly played by Iran. The Israeli escalation was to serve as a warning, we are ready for battle with you, Iran, directly, at this time, even though we are at war in both Gaza and Lebanon. Attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria only slowed after the Biden administration ordered a massive wave of strikes against Iran-allied targets in reaction to the killing of three U.S. soldiers in Jordan earlier this year. UN Security Council fails to condemn strike on Iran in Syria. The United States, Britain and France on Wednesday opposed a Russian-drafted UN Security Council statement that would have condemned an attack on Iran's embassy compound in Syria, which Tehran has blamed on Washington's ally Israel. Press statements by the 15-member council have to be agreed by consensus. Diplomats said the US, backed by France and Britain, told council colleagues that many of the facts of what happened on Monday in Damascus remained unclear and there was no consensus among council members during a meeting on Tuesday. This serves as a clear illustration of the double standards employed by the Western, Troika, and their actual. Rather than declarative, approach to legality and order in the international context, Russia's deputy UN ambassador Dmitry Polyansky said in a post on X. The UN Security Council has issued statements in the past condemning attacks on diplomatic premises. The European Union on Wednesday condemned the strike, saying the inviolability of diplomatic and consular premises and personnel must be respected, and called on countries to show restraint. The US says it has not confirmed the status of the building struck in Damascus, but that it would be concerned if it was a diplomatic facility. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the attack, which destroyed a consular building adjacent to the main embassy complex. Killing seven members of Iran's Revolutionary Guards Iran has accused Israel of violating the founding UN Charter, international law, and also cited several conventions. The 1961 Vienna Convention Governing Diplomatic Relations and 1963 Vienna Convention on Consular Relations define premises as buildings, parts of buildings and land, regardless of ownership, used for the purposes of the diplomatic or consular mission, including the head of the diplomatic mission. Those conventions state that the diplomatic or consular premises shall be inviolable. But they also say the premises should not be used in any manner incompatible with the diplomatic and consular functions. Iran also cited the 1973 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crimes Against Internationally Protected Persons, including diplomatic agents, suggesting those killed were covered by these rules.